Welcome everyone. It's Fosco kicking off the week and the month with the first Braincast for Mostly Learning. What the heck is a Braincast? You would, you know, quite rightly wonder. Well, it's just a fancy name for me talking to other people because, yes, that essentially is what Braincast is all about. It's an informal yet super interesting 30-minute conversation with inspiring people from all walks of life and science, from students to professors and from molecular biologists to experienced clinicians. So what do they have in common? Their love for the brain and all its beautiful unknown territories. No, 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 no. They're not going to be using slides. In fact, they are forbidden to use slides. Slides kill the vibe. People love taking pictures of slides that will never use ever again in their lives. I do too, give me a charge. So no slides. Just get your lunch, your sandwich, your coffee, sit back on your chair, and enjoy and yes you know if you're too busy and get a bleep and you need to dash off that's fine because you can find all videos and really soon podcasts of all brain tests including the psychiatry pandemic series on our website but let's see who we have here with us today professor sir simon wesley to be honest i always mix what goes first is it professor or sir but google reassures me that this time i got it right so simon is the president of the royal society of medicine and past president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, among the million other things that he does, like you know, writing books, writing papers, giving talks, and reviewing the mental health apps as a hobby. In fact, to be honest, I'm convinced that he somehow managed to break the time-space continuum and coexist in various different places at the same time, as his multitasking is beyond human reach. For unexplained to humanity reasons, he also loves going to Paris on a bike cycling the whole thing so he's done this eight times so far to raise funds for the royal british legion in fact to be honest i mean his complete cv requires a whole webinar of its own so let's just stop there and meet the man himself simon welcome that was a brilliant introduction pospo way 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 over the top and very funny <laughs> <laughs> simon, so and a complete time, pack of lies <laughs> can you yeah. hear me well I can hear you fine, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> so, Simon, last time I interviewed you, it was for the most controversial newsletter in the history of the Motsley. That was back in November 2011. I was a court trainee, and you were not even a sir, just a simple, everyday professor with 600 <laughs> papers under your belt, a heavy belt, that must be. So, what changed since 2011? Oh, what's changed in 2011? Well, I mean, even even thinking about what changed in 2019, it's looking like looking back on a different ge ge geological epoch when dinosaurs rule the earth. So I would say virtually everything has changed since then. Um, we're living in, in a very different time um, and which many of us don't find very pleasant. I mean, that's the, it's certainly the biggest change in my lifetime and, and anyone else I think watching this lifetime has changed. So it's completely different. I'm trying to remember what was controversial in 2000. I can't even remember 2011, to be honest, Boss, but what was controversial then? I, I literally it can't was, remember. It was everything Pardon? about the newsletter. I remember I received so many complaints about that newsletter. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. But they still enjoy that my fault? <laughs> okay. Well, let's see if we can do better this time. <laughs> let's try. So, you know what? I remember I asked you from all the titles that you have, which one would you keep? And with no hesitation, you had that the masters in epidemiology changed your life. But in order to get that master, Simon, you needed to study in a university. And that seems to be all the more difficult nowadays. Students, you know, they are uncertain about the future of their studies. Lecturers mm -hmm. are faced with losing their jobs and universities faced with massive financial losses. According to an analysis by London Economics, Universities will be hit by a 2.6 billion pound shortfall in the next academic year. What does this mean? The losses income could result in 30,000 jobs being lost. So are things that that green, you think? Yes. I mean, what, what do you expect me to say? 
um, oh. the loss of overseas students coming uh, certainly next year, possibly a change forever, is crippling to every single university. Um, it will have major effects on Kings. We will survive, others won't. It looks like SOAS is on its last legs at the moment, which would be a complete tragedy. And lots of smaller places that are even more dependent on teaching income than we are um, will, will probably merge, I would have thought. But it's a catastrophe for the sector, and it's one which this government shows the very little sign of wanting to um, come to our aid. So yes, it, it's um, awful. I, I don't know what to say. But what's even worse, possible is not even that we're going to we're going to shrink, etc. But for those you know still here and those who still come to university, it's going to be a very different and very difficult experience. And I'm glad, really glad, I'm not leaving school this year or leaving university because one of the ironies and paradoxes of this situation is the people who are going to suffer the most are the generation who are about to leave school who will find if they get to university it will be a, could easily be a rather sterile unpleasant experience and for those leaving university who are going to be three times more likely to be unemployed so the burden is fall, falling mainly on that generation and yet they're the ones least affected by um, the pandemic itself. And, and this is unique, really. This is unique. And mm. it's an interesting question how long that generation will tolerate the sacrifices they've been asked to make on behalf of people not like you, but maybe people like me. And, and I have no answer to that question. But I think it's the tragedy of COVID is the people who are going to suffer the most. It's not me, but them. And I mean, I've even heard that you know, Cambridge University is not going to open its doors for face-to-face -face, uh, lectures, which is, I mean, you know, it's 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 really crazy. But you, you are I think that was a leak. Excuse I me? think that was a leak. I don't actually think that is their position. It was leaked. Okay. Um, yeah, but but certainly it'll be maybe ten percent, uh, wow. or maybe not. But but I don't think they've come to a decision yet. What's clear is if we reopen university in a time of social distancing, it will be, you know, maybe 10%, maybe, maybe mm. slightly more, maybe slightly less. But most people will not be able to have a, a university experience in the way that you or I or most of the people watching this would think a university is all about. Yeah. I mean, you are the president of the Royal Society of Medicine which is one of the country's mm -hmm. major providers of postgraduate medical education. So how are you dealing with all this? Well, I mean, it's it's awful for us. We're losing money hand over fist, as is everyone else. I mean, we're probably slightly better than others, but we're, um, we're it's a major, it's a very bad situation. We're doing a lot of stuff now. We're doing a webinar like you're doing, which is incredibly successful, by the way, but we're not making any money from it. And the idea is that everything through COVID is going to be free. Well, it can't be forever. We're losing a million a month. Um, some of our other institutions we know are doing worse. Um, we're losing also on the hospitality side of things. People like to come together when they come to lectures and meetings. They also like to go to a bar. They like to eat, etc. Uh, all of that finished. Um, so it's a, a, a pretty awful financial situation for everyone. And I, I don't know that people have quite grasped, you know, um, what that means in the longer term. I mean, you know, in a, in a recent position paper in the Lancet Psychiatry, yourself, among several other high-profile academics, you call for research action for mental health science. I mean, I know it may sound, you know, a bit simplistic, but why is it imperative to have more research in a time like that, like this one that we're going through? I, I think because it's very clear that a lot of the things that are happening we're uncertain about we don't know if you just take the most obvious one it's not clear at bullmore the chair at cambridge who i interviewed uh, last week just like you're interviewing me but i can now parrot what he said he said it's clear this is a neurotoxic virus but quite how neurotoxic for how long and what the consequences will be remain really obscure at the moment because it is new um and it's unclear what the pathway will be it's creating you know the least of its problems is this sense of taste uh, smell. It's clearly creating much more toxic confusion in the states than we've ever expected. Could be contributing to the respiratory death. Uh, could be through infection on the brain. Could lead to chronic, chronic fatigue syndromes that um, probably I was being controversial about 10 years ago. All of these things, but we don't know. 
And then on the other side, on the more psychological, social, community side, uh, educational issues, which are obviously all of these impact on, on mental health and psychology, psychiatry, we've never faced before. And the consequences could be profound. And the economic consequences, think of 2008, um, it's going to be far worse. And when um, I was with Evan Davis on, on, on one of these shows recently, who's, he used the phrase Great Depression. And in capital letters, and I said, that's a bit of an exaggeration. And he said, no, I think it's actually, it's the opposite of exaggeration. This, what we're heading for could well be worse. And all of us in our field know what that means. You know, when it was Marie Yehuda who found about the relationship between unemployment and suicide during the Great Depression, one of the key pieces of psychiatric epidemiology. Well, we're going to be rediscovering that. And I, I must admit, possibly, I'm alarmed by this because I'm alarmed by the fact that there's no economist, for example, on SAGE. And why isn't there? And that looking at the last public opinion polls that we were doing, we published one, we worked with Bobby Duffy at our own King's Policy Unit. Um, that it's still the case in Britain, the vast majority of people see this still as predominantly or, or entirely a health issue. And in the rest of Europe, people are more nuanced about it. If you look at many other European countries, they the, the level of people seeing it as a purely health has been going down, and the people who see it as an economic crisis going up. In Britain, the level of people seeing it as a health crisis is actually going up. Um, and I think that's alarming to for to give. It's not going to give the space for the trade-offs that are going to be needed in the weeks and months to come. And, and we can see that in the mess the government's made of it, its announcements recently for wanting to start a trade-off. And yet the public are really, on the whole, by and large, resisting that. And that's something none of us predicted. OK, so let's get down to business then. So countries in <laughs> lockdown, people in quarantine, actually one of my juniors, I uh, hi Tom, so he told me that the word quarantine is derived from the Italian word quaranta giorni, which means 40 days. So ships arrived mm -hmm. in Venice from infected ports were required to sit at anchor for 40 days before landing. And here Correct. we are unable to go pretty much anywhere, with the exception of course of Dominic Cummings, you know. But joking aside, the quarantine is not a pleasant process. It's been a hard time for many people. So how have you experienced it yourself? Well, I had an extra two weeks because my wife was one of the first to get ill. So I had two weeks quarantine on the day when I was finally allowed to go out and went off to our local pub, the bloody thing shut, uh, literally shut. So I've had wow. two more weeks than everyone else. Um, I mean, yeah, you know, I've got a job, which at the moment is secure. I've got a fairly nice house, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so nothing like as bad as it would be for other people, but I hate it. And as you said in your introduction, what did you say? You said your 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 podcast, your webinar, it's all about people talking to each other. Yeah. And that's the one thing that we're not doing. And I find that awful. I, I don't like it at all. Um, I can't wait for the day when it ceases. And 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 I can't believe that that a, a proportion of people, um, I've forgotten the figure now, but it's not insignificant, seem to accept with something close to equanimity. Um, a, this word new norm, oh, I, I, the only two things I really hate, one is Simon you're muted, if I ever hear that again I will scream, and the other is this phrase the new norm, accepting that we may enter into a prolonged period, possibly even in perpetuity people are saying, in which we will have to socially distance as a species, I just find that ghastly, but it's, uh, some people are saying that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you also published you know, a paper back in March at the Lancet, and you talked about mm -hmm. something like that. You talked about the, the psychological impact of yeah. quarantine, and it's certainly way more complex and serious than just being bored. So can you tell us yeah. a bit about that? Yes, I mean, we were lucky. I mean, <laughs> one of the things we called for was more research, but that one of the problems is there's huge amounts of research now, most of it yeah. awful. Um, that paper was published eight weeks ago. It's already been cited 150 times. Now, obviously, the paper is a work of sheer genius, but nothing can be cited that quickly if people are not publishing too much research, to be frank, frank to you, with you. But what that did say was, you might say, bleeding obvious, which is that all previous quarantines where we've been doing research, which, you know, MERS and SARS and Ebola, have always, but always been associated with psychological consequences. 
So we were saying this one will be as well. And of course it is. We're not seeing it as visibly as we should because of the lockdown. So we might take comfort from the fact that the rates of deliberate self-harm have gone down in A&Es across Britain, they've halved. We might take com comfort if we were being stupid, <laughs> um, but we wouldn't take comfort in thinking that when this eases, we're going to discover we're already seeing in terms of child health, um, in terms of domestic violence, et cetera, in terms, and I'm sure uh, right. as we start to record better, we will see increases. I think we're already seeing an increase in OCD, aren't we? Um, and, and all these things. So yes, it has psychological effects. And just like COVID, getting COVID itself has psychological effects, but lockdown on this scale also is. And you know that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, by the way. I'm not arguing for that at all. But I am saying that like all interventions, it comes with side effects. These side effects are increasingly profound. And rather worryingly for our audience, when the public were asked last week about what did they think were the most important consequences of the lockdown and quarantine? Mental health, despite everyone talking about it, came, I think, seventh. Very few people thought it was a serious issue, which I'm afraid this audience will find a bit shocking, but don't think that everyone shares our interest in mental health. Yeah. But you know what? It's interesting because there was a recent review of past coronavirus outbreaks including also some limited evidence from this current pandemic. And mm -hmm. what they show is that most patients should recover without experiencing mental illness. Yeah. However, there is a possibility for one in the longer term. And in fact, there was also a recent JAMA paper that talked about uh, being female at younger age, that you may experience some mental symptoms, you know, in the long term. So what are you expecting to see in patients? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's going back to what we were writing about in that paper. That that it will be increased seems very clear. Um, I can't really think of scenarios where it won't, but I'll just come back to that in a sec about that. But um, so we expect to see increases uh, and, and the population studies are showing increases in depression, anxiety. I don't think they're able to pick up changes in psychosis as yet, but um, already uh, what we're hearing from my colleagues and from you is, and indeed of the small number of patients I've got, which is not very many these days, but all of them have relapsed. Um, at the moment. So I, I expect we will see, as the picture emerges, an increase in that. The reason I want just to caveat slightly is, is the, the paper I think you're talking about in JAMA is a kind of example of research that is very well-meaning but not very helpful, if it's the one I'm thinking of, that said it was actually looking at, at um, uh, healthcare workers and said yeah. that females and younger ones were more affected. But it's a kind of example of, of you know, that paper would never have been published in JAMA last year. Never. Yeah. JAMA is the world's number three journal. It's one of these probability, uh, it's not a probability sample, it, it's a snowball sample. They put an advert out and then it was snowballed around um, Italian uh, healthcare workers. There were 800 people, was it? Or, and it was 1,300 responded. But they themselves say, yeah, there are a huge, that's a tiny proportion of the health professionals in Italy. And they have no idea what the response rate is, no idea what the bias is. Now, you may think that's just me being the boring boffin, but it isn't, because mm -hmm. it means that could be very, very misleading. And, you know, you will have been deluged with these kind of surveys that have sometimes gone through ethics, some that haven't, not gone through R&D. And actually, the fact they're getting published with such frequency and rapidity worries mm -hmm. me, because they could be giving an overly negative we also think that there are a lot of, let's talk about healthcare staff in this country who are finding this actually challenging for sure, but also very um, um, rewarding in the way that all our studies of soldiers on deployment. The commonest reaction we get is people coming back and say, as a result of my deployment, I can handle stress better. Now I'm talking to junior doctors who say the same thing. They're also saying they've never had such good supervision. That may be a reflection on my generation, how useless we are at supervising, but they're saying that. And they're also saying we've never worked in teams that are so cohesive and we've never felt that we're doing more good than we are now. So we have to capture that as well if we're to have a fair picture of what you know, adversity does. It creates more casualties, certainly, but it also, some people will come through regard this like many of our soldiers do deployments as something that they are proud to have achieved and experienced so it's more complicated picture 
than that. I don't know why I'm picking on this one JAMA paper, but you mentioned it. Yeah. Um, which did all it had was increase in A, B, C, D, and E. And it didn't look at anything else like post traumatic growth. It didn't look at all the other things that I'm sure Italian doctors are also experiencing. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being mean to the authors because they did they did say, unlike most of these surveys, what their um, limitations were. Meanwhile, can I make one plug, Bosco? And the only reason I've come on is to make a plug. Is that okay? <laughs> Okay, so hopefully many of you, if you work in any of the KHP trusts, will have uh, received all sorts of increasingly imploring emails and pictures and cards and posters about NHS check, which we're running in these three trusts, 40,000 people, and we were in the Nightingales before they closed, asking you to take part in yet another survey. But this one does have a denominator. So, you know, we've gone through the R&D procedures. It does have ethics approval. It does have funding. We does have the means to follow up. And this one is already making a difference um, in terms of you know, feedback, aggregate feedback on, on uh, staff support and, and, P and uh, PPE. So do please take part in this one. It is the one thing that actually doesn't have those faults. And therefore, if we have enough people can be generalized across the NHS. So I've made my plug now. Please do it. I hope you've done it POSPO or I'll just switch the computer straight off. No, no, I did it, I did it, I did it, I, did, I promise I did, you did it. You did, okay. Good man, so, you'll forget. You mentioned, you know, about the PPE, and now the, the mm. pandemic has been a great, a great emergency exercise of unpreparedness. Even, even I feel that messaging went wrong. Go out, but don't. Meet people, but don't. Wear a mask, but don't. No, 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 no. Wear it, but not this one. Don't drive your car unless you want to test your eyesight while suffering from COVID and your first name starts with a D. So, so <laughs> what went wrong in your view? What happened there? Well, yes, I mean, when when we advise, we, myself, James Rubin and co, we, I, I direct the Health Protection Research Unit uh, for a PHE at situated at King's. One of the things we do is risk communication. There are very simple guides to risk communication that we give to leaders of the NHS, political leaders, etc which is three things. Number one, never tell the public not to panic. Number two, um, I've got one number two, is oh yes, don't give false reassurance. And number three, as soon as you can, get the doctors in. And they started out pretty well on that actually. And then when you do give your messages, make sure you should be telling people why, what they should do, how they should do it, and why they should do it. And stay in is a perfect health message. Very clear, well communicated, and accepted far more than anybody thought possible. Okay, that was a clear message. Um, a bit like don't drink and drive, or you know, clunk click every trip for seat belts. Clear messages, and, and you know why, you know what, and you know how. Now, then it gets difficult, and I don't blame them entirely because the message is now more complicated, and it, it's going, and it's also more segmented. It's different now in different parts of the country. It's different in different age groups because, uh, and also it's going to get very different because people now have very different appetites for risk. So as we move towards increasing risk, which is what we're going to do, um, unless you believe that, you know, that unless you say, well, we won't do this until it's safe, you know, which is a nonsensical public health adage because nothing has ever been safe. It wasn't safe before and won't be safe after. And that's another thing, never say something is safe, just say it's safe enough. But that one is breaking down because of the complexity of the message and also because they cocked it up. Uh, and there's no way they were putting it that the phrase be alert is the worst kind of message. Messages that tell you how to feel, i.e. don't panic, stay calm, are always badly received or not received at all. And it doesn't tell you what to do. Alert for what? And what do I do? If I am alert, what do I do then? What do I see that makes me alert? And the other problem is we already have half the population is very, very alert, very anxious. And we actually are into a situation in which we are going to find it very difficult for people to come down from that alertness when it is time to go outside more, when it is time to do more social uh, mixing um, or to send your children to school. And the figures on sending children to school are really very scary. And the figures on people who um, feel that they could go to a restaurant ever again or to a sporting mm. event are quite scary, possible, quite scary. 
it is quite scary. And I mean, you know, mm. on one hand, you have the public, uh, you have the patients that actually suffer from COVID, and mm. on the other hand, you have the pay the people that actually look after the patients with COVID. Yes. And if there was one word that has been used over and over again about the healthcare system around the world is overstretched, which basically means we need, but we don't have. We need beds, we need ventilators, nurses, doctors, but we don't have enough of them. And we heard about horror stories in Italy when essentially doctors were deciding who lives or dies. So with that in mind, so Williamson, Murphy and Greenberg wrote a paper this past April about moral injury, a term most commonly used in the military. So can you tell us mm. a bit about, about this? What is moral injury and how translatable and relevant it is to healthcare staff? Well, we did, we, Neil and I wrote, wrote that paper and we did take it from military and we took it from work we've been doing in the military. And it's about, it's not a form, everyone thinks it's a mental health problem. It isn't, it's a moral. And the classic example we picked up from work we did um, uh, with British soldiers in Bosnia and then Iraq and Afghanistan, but first of in Bosnia, was where you, where you see something really bad happening and you're powerless to intervene. Okay, so normally you would have intervened, but because of the rules of engagement, for example, in the peacekeeping operation, you saw atrocities taking place and you couldn't stop it. And Srebrenica for the Dutch was the classic example. Or, you know, you, you felt you were put into a situation that you couldn't cope with, that you didn't have the right equipment, so you, and, or that you were exposed to friendly fire. You know, yeah. you can deal with the enemy, but you can't deal with our side bombing you or shelling you because that's wrong, that shouldn't have happened. And then we translate that saying, this was in March, it looked like that that was coming to the NHS, that would be overwhelmed, as it had been in Italy. People would be making life and death decisions. Well, we've always done that. that that's, that's what doctors do, that's what nurses do, that's not the issue. But the issue would be that they would have made those decisions, but they would have, they would have had the right resources from the right people. And so if your loved one had perished, maybe in a terrorist bomb or, infection, whatever, when the relatives come to see you and they said, doctor, did you do everything that you could? Was everything done? And you would be able to say, yes, it was. I'm really sorry what happened. But what happened if you didn't do everything? And that's when you get a moral injury. I'd have done better last year. I'll do better next year. And that is much more difficult because it involves anger, shame, and guilt. Whereas PTSD is about trauma, anger, shame, and guilt, and much more difficult emotions. So we wrote the paper saying this is what could happen in the NHS. Um, it looked like it was going to happen. And we know from some early work that some areas did. Whether or not it'll be quite as big a problem as we uh, suspected, we will know when we get the results of NHS check, the first population-based study yet. We shall see. But that's the concept. And it looked like it was applicable to, to, to what was thought to be coming up and certainly what had happened in Italy and, and yeah. certainly some people definitely who are listening now will know what we mean. They've been in that situation and, 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 they were, and, and we're not saying this is a, a psychiatric injury, we're saying, it's a, as I said, it's a moral injury. It's a question yeah. of your values uh, and the position you've been in and it could be quite difficult and the solutions are not just seeing people like me, they're more complicated, leaders, maybe even Padres, moral, you know, we don't have the monopoly on moral issues, maybe philosophers and historians and Padres, all of these people, I suppose, could be involved. And, and Simon, what, what about the next day? I mean, there have been lots of, you know, reshaping and restructuring, and my fear is that, you know, we'll end up with suboptimal solutions just because, well, well, it worked during the pandemic, then we should carry on doing this. So what are the pitfalls you feel that lie ahead? Well, I think there's two. The first thing is if we rush back to, if the NHS goes back to quote normal too quickly, first it doesn't give the people who've been involved, it's, you know, in this, well, I know it's a mistake to use military analogies, but sometimes they're helpful in this deployment, as it were. They're always given time to decompress, get back with their families, have, you know, leave and all those things that I do think people will need, you know, I'm, I'm not even at the front line at all, but I'm not had a holiday since October and many of the others far worse, okay? So that there needs to be that. Second, there needs to be able to look that, you know, we've got by without some of those burdens that we've carried for years, like the CQC, things like that, in which we spend a billion pounds a year. 
Now, how did we manage to provide good care without the CQC? Do we need all that? Do we? We need some, but do we need as much as we've had? And, and clearly some of the good things, my wife's a GP, will tell you that the, we achieve more um, switch to um, distance working, to um, assessment, to triage, et cetera, in, in a week than we've done in 15 years. And I'm sure a lot of that will stay. But I hope that we take a little bit of time to think, well, you know, what did work? What did we not actually need that we thought we needed? And by the way, what do we really need like, for example, working back in good teams with good leaders, good training, on the spot, good support, you know, that kind of stuff that we've now seen the importance of. So, but I hope that we don't, I hope we don't speed, as it were. We allow staff time to take a deep breath, both from the top and from the bottom, and to accept that this has been an extraordinary time. And by the way, we're not out of the woods yet, and not nobody here thinks that. No, but when it does start to look more like that, I think a period of kind of decompression and rethinking um, and um, thoughtful thoughtfulness, right? not mindfulness, thoughtfulness. Is <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Simon. Great of people. That was Professor Sarah Simon Weatherly. Next week, I'm taking a virtual flight to the United States of America that don't seem to be as united following last week's riots and to one of the most prestigious universities in the world, Johns Hopkins University, with me, Dr. Paul Nestat, co-director of the Johns Hopkins Anxiety Disorders Clinic and assistant professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences. We'll talk about how the states face the pandemic, especially when there are so many already existing difficulties in accessing healthcare there, but also explore the extremely serious matter of gun laws and their link to suicides, as America is going through the second largest increase in gun purchases in the recent years. If you have any suggestions, recommendations, or just to say how awful we are, okay, don't hate us, we're not that bad, just drop us a line. See you all next Monday at 1 p.m. Post talk, brain test for mostly learning over and out.